Sing to the Lord a new song, a song of hope and rejoicing. Praise God for wonderful acts of mercy and kindness. God has remembered God's faithful ones. God has poured blessings upon blessings upon us. Praise the Lord, all the earth, shout your praise. Rejoice, for God is truly with us. Let us worship God together. For God does the marvelous things in our eyes. You may be seated as our readers come forward. by our side let Israel say if the Lord had not been by our side when the people attacked us they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared flared against us the flood would have engulfed us the dry would have swept over us the raging water would have swept us away praise to be the Lord who has let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the flower's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The insightful reading comes from James 5, chapter 13 to 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing the songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with the oil of, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the per sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned. They will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of righteousness person of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed that and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you shall wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Indeed, thanks be to God. Lord, we thank you for sending us these leaders. You have shown us in the youth of Wences that all of us have something to teach as well as learn. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will be with us as we continue to worship and praise you. And as James has written in his epistle, if any are among, in trouble, let them pray. If any are happy, let them sing songs of praise. If any are sick, let them call the elders to pray over them and anoint them. Lord, you have anointed us here to be part of your service together, and we welcome you into our lives this morning. Amen.
Desert Beach this morning. It's so good to see all of you here. God bless you this morning. You are online. Good to see you, Nate. Good to see you, Tony. The Downs, the Clyde family. And it is especially good to see Rita this morning. God bless you. It is so good to see you. Stand to your feet as we sing the Lord's Prayer together. Shamanic hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Buried Land.
we read our scripture together. 2 Timothy verses 5 through 9, and we're going to do it together. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to the holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you this moment that you are with us. Help your preacher now. Open the hearts and the minds of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I'm using as a thought this morning, shake off fear, shaking off fear. If we tell the truth, all of us have been in a place of fearfulness in one time or another in our lives. We are looking at Paul's second letter to Timothy who is a faithful young man who Paul has mentored. Our focus this morning is Paul's admonishment to Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, fear, or cowardice, but rather a spirit of power, love, self-control, and discipline. The question is, why does Paul feel the need to even address fear at all? The apostle does not strike me as one to talk just to hear himself talking. You know people like that. Because, or because he likes the sound of his voice or has a sophisticated, learned way with words to give him the proverbial attaboy, there you go. It's highly probable Paul is writing from jail in Rome. You can imagine at the forefront of Paul's mind the time is rapidly approaching of his demise and how his death at the hands of the Roman government could send shockwaves to the faith communities he is connected to. Timothy is a teenager tasked with the responsibility of leading this church. This is quite a responsibility for a young man of his age. Additionally, you know there are most likely some awkward power dynamics surfacing. He is commissioned to lead the folks who probably helped raise him, looked after him, and you know there were at least a few who thought they absolutely knew more than Timothy, or that Timothy should rely on them for advice. No doubt there would have been a few who believed Timmy was too young and not capable. The other reason I believe Paul comes at fear head on is because he is speaking to leaders and laity at large saying, you might have some difficult days ahead, turbulent moments and uncertainty, but hold on to the foundations of your faith. Trust in what you've been taught the Lord will make a way. First, sadly, fear works. It motivates people to act impulsively. It convinces us we cannot afford time for deliberate consideration. Y'all with me? Fear suggests time is working against us. Often the mix of these thoughts and realities pushes us to a response that is not in their or our best interest. Fear can cause us to see our neighbors as suspects. Fear can lead us to believe conspiracies and other things not based in reality. It should not be surprising that folks trying to achieve a favorable outcome for personal or means to gain power traffic in fear. Politicians, pastors, 
church people, and the like, all do it. Yes, the faith, faith spaces are not immune to using fear as a tactic. Even if all of that were not the case, still, fear will always try to creep in. We will have to deal with it from time to time, reminding ourselves fear does not come from God, but God has given us tools to deal with fear, whether in relationship issues, financial, social, or within our own families. What is it about the obscure, unaccustomed, unknown, unfamiliar that scares us? Is it the fact that we can't see the end result, predict actions and responses? And if we're paying attention just a little bit now in society, we are seeing it play out right before our eyes. Because some are unfamiliar with Haitian culture, it's easy to make crazy stuff out about their dietary habits. When we don't understand either because we don't, we have not been exposed to or researched or read or, or just don't want to know more, we will ruminate about situations from a place of fear that may lead us to draw the wrong conclusions. I've never faced the unimaginable fear of the horror of having to deal with a miscarriage and unable to access treatment because of my physical location. But you and I do have the capacity to empathize. I'm not going out on a limb here and say that 99.99999% of those listening to me do not know what it, how it feels to navigate life in American society as a black person. That's not that deep though or an LGBTQI person. But we all have the capacity to understand and learn and empathize, but fear often pushes us to the corner. Let's just not deal with it because of the unknown potential ramification. Fear allows us to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Dr. King alludes to this in here, to this dynamic in his letter from the Birmingham jail addressing his white clergy colleagues who thought the time was not right for the confrontation around civil rights, the perfect being the enemy of the good. King's response was talked about the fierce urgency of now. Think about this dilemma. If every sign and signal a young person or any person receives is that they're not good enough, don't have what it takes, who you are makes people uncomfortable, so it's better to hide. Fear will grab hold and cripple their outlook, keeping them from pursuing their dreams and living authentically. If we are honest, we are creatures of habit. We thrive in the known. We like things done the same way and others around us to live, see, think, and eat love as we do because there is comfort in the familiar. Somehow the idea of sameness gives us a feeling of security. Scientists say that, that our brains prefer the familiar because it takes mental, less mental effort to process. Fear of the unknown gives us anxiety. Familiar things are easier to understand and predict. The result is that we conserve our mental energy. We create a mental and emotional safety zone where our daily habits provide a sense of security. Psychologists call this the intolerance of uncertainty. It's naturally developed characteristics that over time can reach high levels that impact a person's ability to cope and function. We can become cocooned by our own fear of the unknown. Here's the rub, to quote Shakespeare. Our feeling of safety in that cocoon is just a mirage, full fueled by wishful thinking. We cannot control tomorrow. We don't know how tomorrow is going to play out. But the good news is we know who does hold out all tomorrows. Consider what we miss when we retreat the sameness. Sticking with the familiar keeps us from exploring the unfamiliar. In science, it would mean no new discoveries like vaccines, space exploration, or cures for diseases. In the arts, it would mean no new expression of ideas or thoughts or visual communications. In education, it would mean no new discoveries of methods for learning and application. In politics, it means we prefer to go back to yesteryear rather than work to solve present and future dilemmas. 
And in Christianity, it means the slow demise of our faith as we fail to set up to meet the challenge of seeking new folks to join the journey. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, fear defeats more people than any other one thing in the world. Fear is certainly no friend to all of us pressing towards the prize of the high calling. Allowing fear of the unfamiliar has no place to spread of the gospel. The only way to engage, evangelize, push forward is to trust the attributes of God. What are those attributes? Paul tells us they are power, love, and a sound, disciplined mind to usher us forward. Steve Jobs observed, you cannot connect the dots looking backward. You only can connect them looking forward. In other words, our future is unknown and there's nothing we can do about that. All the biographies are written at the end of life, not the beginning. And the difference between winning and losing is most often not quitting. The spirit of fear is what the Greeks called cowardice. And in this 21st century, for us, it's about being afraid of other ways of thinking, being, living, worshiping, and experiences. Fearful of making mistakes because one bad move could call a cascade of unexpected hardship on this life journey. Am I talking to the right church? Yes. No one enjoys suffering, but the good news is God does not leave us without tools we need to face all the things we need to shake our fear. The first tool, I want you to get this, is power. This just isn't just any power. It's the power of God through the, through the Holy Spirit. And I'm of the belief we don't trust God's power enough. We certainly don't apply God's power enough. When we decline to use that power through the Holy Spirit, we are saying, no, thank you. It's kind of like leaving the car in the driveway, even though the tank is full of gas and ready to go. God's empowerment of us is multifaceted and essential. God gives us power so that we can be bold examples of love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace, even in the face of opposition. God gives us power to resist and overcome situations and circumstances that could be stumbling blocks. God gives us power as a guide to understanding all truth about the world and the world to come. And God gives us power through the Holy Spirit to strengthen us as the Holy Spirit fills the gap between our hearts and purpose. And we need it to use it to the fullest. I'm learning when it's not to worry about where it will take me. I'm trying to just go. Be filled with the Spirit and be empowered to face the unknown. God's power is the air for our lungs. God's power is the strength for our weaknesses. God's power is the assurance of our anxieties. God's power is the touch for our spiritual trials. God's power is the inspiration for our spiritual and physical exhaustion. God's power is the lifting of our burdens. Just keep pressing towards the mark of the prize of a high. The second tool God gives us, according to Paul, is love. For those of us who follow Jesus, we are always to use the power, this power, in conjunction with love as a means of executing what love requires. This is where we often get tripped up. Sometimes we confuse love with power. Sometimes, say it again, sometimes we, refuse love, we confuse love with tolerance. Mm. I was telling a group of leaders a few days ago, we tell the world we are an open and affirming faith community. We printed our ONA statement in our bulletin every week, but are we really ONA? My sense is, after being here almost two years, is the initial work was done, but the hard ongoing work of learning to love those who are in the LGBTQI community and other communities still needs to continue. Yes. yes, everyone is welcome, but there's more work to be done. The truth is, I fall short at loving people where they are too. I'll say it again. I fall short on loving people where they are too. It was pointed out to me that I wasn't really hearing someone I care about. I had to apologize and own it. Love me enough to tell me the truth when I've missed the mark. Love is empowered by the Holy Spirit. We can't love our enemy without God's power. The truth is 
we can't even love our neighbor without God's power. Love is the earthly expression of God's grace. This kind of love bears burdens, carries crosses, faces circumstances, builds confidence, fulfills responsibility, and defeats enemies. God's love is what empowers us to love. God's love is the secret of our joy, the unction of our teaching, the inspiration for our singing, and the power for our forward movement. Don't believe me? Just try to head a ministry or a committee, whether it's pastoring, leading a board, baking cookies, making soup, without God's love, see how far you get. It will be a mess. Paul said, though I speak with tongues of humans and angels, and if I don't have love, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The great James Brown put it this way, we are just talking loud and saying nothing. Just full of hot air. Christians without love are just people making noises. If we want to move forward and change the world, we need to be equipped with God's love. Because love changes everything it makes contact with. Some of you know that it can change the bitter, the sorrowful, and the lonely into the sweet because you've applied it and you've witnessed its transformational power. Some of you serving in our church know that love can change the broken into the blessed and the worthless into the priceless. God's reservoir of love never runs dry. God's love is dependable, genuine, trustworthy, and sincere. And when it's spilling over in us, it's able to quench the world's thirst and transform lives. Lastly, the third tool is a sound mind in self-discipline. Some of you might be thinking, that's easy, I'm already in my right mind. You may want to double check. But the sound mind goes, God gives us covers more than our emotional and mental state. And while it is true that Isaiah said, God, he will keep those in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him, there's much more than peace we achieve when we allow the Lord to guide our thoughts. With God's sound mind operating in us, we can, we can count on God's sound instruction and correction. We're not left hanging. And when we take the wrong step, God's rod and staff guide us back to where we belong. Back to the path laid out for us. And when life takes us down the unfamiliar path, there is no need to panic. Life may often seem run amok and unpredictable, but when the ground starts moving under our feet, and what used to be is gone. A sound mind, a self-disciplined mind reminds us that God is still in control. If the sun, S-O-N, is shining in you and I, we can be sure that our future is right. Now, there is a cost for these tools, power, love, and a sound mind. These are gifts to be shared. If you put your trust in Jesus, there's, there are really only two responses we can have. We can forget everything and run, or you and I can face everything and rise and rise with the risen Savior in our hearts. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, cowardice, or timidity, but a power of love and a sound disciplined mind. These words were part of Paul's last charge to the young preacher named Timothy. Paul knew that his days were numbered at the hands of Nero, the Roman emperor, so he threw his whole soul into the task of urging Timothy to carry on the work of the ministry without fear. Today, Paul's charge still stands. We have to be ready to move without fear. I know that in these times, things can look bleak, but we still have to be fearless because the Lord is on our side, Winces. With the Lord on our side, no night is too dark to endure. No situation is too mighty to conquer. No crisis is too critical to confront. No burden is too heavy to bear. No doubt is too strong to defeat. No problem is too big to solve. We move forward without fear because the Lord is on our side. Shake off fear. God bless you this morning.